Okay, guys, so we should be live. I'm just as ever going to double check in the group, um, the formalities of going live on Facebook, just making sure that we are actually live in the group. Um, and then we've got an amazing guest to introduce. We have some awesome questions, um, possibly the best backdrop I've ever seen on a, a guest here live in the lab. Um, but I'll just double check that we are live in the group. Let me just check. Yes, okay, we are live, good. Guys, if you can hear and see me, please make sure that you say hello, make sure you drop your questions during the uh, interview. Um, we've already got Attila on here saying that Jason's a legend, uh, which he is, but um, yeah, very, very, very lucky and fortunate to be joined by an old industry friend of mine, um, Jason Akatif, who is uh, CEO at uh, A4D, uh, been in the industry for many, many years. Um, I'm going to pass over to Jason, if that's okay, and let you do a little bit of an intro. But the $500 million man um, are, are on paid media online, and we've got some incredible questions for Jason. I'm really, this is a, a really like an honor for me. I'm super, super looking forward to diving into some of these questions that you guys have answered, because I want to hear the answers myself as well. So um, Jason, first and foremost, if you could just do a little, tiny little intro for those who don't know you if they don't know you I don't know where they've been but um yeah just just give us a bit of background of, of what you've been up to and, and how you come to this space sure uh thanks for thanks for having me here today Oliver um you know when when anybody calls me a legend it just makes me think I'm old so but, uh, and uh <laughs> you know I've, I've been in this space since uh since 2003 I'm 45 years old now and and probably one of the older people around the industry, but, uh, you know, it's treated me very well and, and, and I've done very well with it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, for, for those, just real briefly, uh, most of you know my story, but I, I, uh, I uh, started, uh, I was, got laid off of a job and, and back in around 2003, I bought a, an ebook uh, called, it was about cloaking search engines and um, basically you would make content and for the search engines and then you'd redirect to to affiliate offers and um you know I, I bought that book for i think it was 36 or 39 dollars or something like that and um you know it was a very different uh it was a very different time you know there was no forums really or you know information or there was no gurus or you know, facebook didn't exist myspace right. didn't exist none of this stuff existed and you know, it was uh, some underground bullet bo bulletin boards where you had people people doing stuff. Really, the only the only thing that was fairly prevalent uh, and and strong in that day and time was uh, was the adult space, which I I never wanted to be involved with. But you know, it kind of was the forefront uh, of this stuff. But I um, <clears throat> you know, I bought that, and then I spent about a year. Uh, I got laid off my job, and I spent about a year trying to. Uh, trying to figure out how to make this stuff work. Um, you know, and I, I still have my tax return around. I think, I think in that year I made $26,000 and, uh, that was Not all too stuff. bad for your first year though. Well, hold on. That was unemployment. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't actually make anything, but I was going to say, I think I made a lot less in my first year online, but yeah, <laughs> I, I spent about uh, 14 to 17 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, trying to figure this thing out, teaching myself to code and a and a bunch of other stuff. And yeah, I do remember very vividly at one point in time there was a, you know, I was running some Google AdSense where you put the ads on the site and, and get paid for clicks. And yeah, um, I remember at one point, you know, I'd I'd been building some of these sites and not you know getting five views a day, 10, 10 visitors a day. By the way, I was excited about that at the time and. One day I remember I was like, oh, 36 people came to my website. That's pretty amazing. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. can't wait to hear how many people come to your sites these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah quite, a, quite a few at this point. But, yeah. um, you know, the I, I just remember Google sent me a check for, for like $1.36 in the mail. And, uh, you know, I never had talked to anybody or interacted with anybody. I just signed up on a, on a thing and, right. and ultimately, uh, you know, I, I took that to the bank and I, you know, I thought it wasn't real. And I thought as soon as I took it to the bank, they were going to, they were going to tell me it was fraudulent and, you know, somebody was scamming me somehow. And then uh, they took it and then, you know, next, you know, uh, I was just sitting at home refreshing on the, on the bank account because I thought it was going to bounce. And 
you know, that dollar and 36 cents went through. And that's amazing. You know, that, at that point in time, I was like, well, this is super cool. I don't, it's not a lot of money and it's not much, but I totally see the opportunity here. And, you know, from that point in time, I, I had decided, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of my life in, in one facet or, facet or another. And, you know, it's, it's super interesting because, you know, back then, you know, digital marketing wasn't even really a thing. And now it's really kind of, you know, delved into all facets of all business. I, I'm in a CEO group called Vistage. Uh, I think there's 14 CEOs. Of, right. This company does 1.3 billion a year in sales. And, you know, most of these guys are retail and, and, major distribution, uh, you know, wholesale distribution stuff. Uh, very, very few of them are any doing any direct to consumer and, and any e-commerce. And wow, the meeting we had uh, just this uh, just this last week, because of COVID and what's going on and right. sales shutting down, yeah. all this stuff happening, you know, everybody was talking about uh you know online e-commerce direct to consumer everyone wanted to hear what you had to say right <laughs> yeah, well, i mean they've been listening to me for for two years now and they're all like i don't understand your business or what yeah, yeah. still don't understand but it was it was pretty crazy to hear you know a bunch of people that are a hundred percent offline people all of a sudden you know talk about online strategies and and how relevant that is in, in this day and age and and watching that consistent, constant migration uh, in that in that direction, um, you know, just in addition, just like timeline wise, uh, you know, I did some quite a bit of black hat SEO, you know, which essentially is, you know, reverse engineer Google and, and yeah. algorithm and try and understand what ranks and then, you know, figure out how to how to build automation around that. At one point in time, you could point a dig link. Uh, which was a PR nine to a blogger blog, which was a PR ten domain, um, and you could rank for almost any keyword in six hours. So we started That's building, amazing. you know, forty thousand blogger blogs a day and forty thousand dig links a day, pointing it at them and, and ranking for for almost any keyword that we wanted in, in six hours. Nice. Uh, you know, Google would kick us out in two hours, right, or two days. I mean, typically, but we were actually building faster than they could get rid of us. So. Yeah. Was that all automated? I guess you built software to do that. Oh, yeah, I wrote all the code, amazing that stuff back in the day. Um, but you know, just there, it was very, very different time. And and then in about uh, I don't know, two thousand eight, two thousand seven, somewhere in there, I decided, you know, I don't, I don't want to play this cat and mouse game. Um, you know, of, of trying to reverse our algorithms and then kicking me out and, and so forth. And and honestly, White Hat SEO was just too slow for me. I don't I don't right. have the nature for it. It doesn't scale fast enough and hard enough for, for to keep me interested and engaged. So um, I uh, you know I got into media buying about about that point in time and you know we got uh, then A for D started, which was originally ads for dough for yeah. most people know that, but yeah. uh, A, it became A for D and it started in, uh, I bought it from uh, a guy named Rick Gregario uh, for about 20 grand. Uh, Rick was the owner of, um, or actually the, he wasn't the owner. He, he ran Copiac, a guy named Mike Krongle. I remember. I, I bought it from him. I remember Mike, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. My, the only thing I didn't realize, it was all incentive and, and spam traffic okay. the network and it burned all these relationships with with all these merchants, um, you know, so it was like I, I should have started from scratch, but... Um, Did you at you least know, get like a good database of affiliates? And no, it was no? all... It was They're all like doing black hat kind of yeah, I mean, at that gateways at that and... Time, you know, the largest affiliate forum was called Wicked Fire. It was like yep, I know. thousand members, you know, which back then was, you know, unbelievable. Like, un you know, there was no, still no Facebook or anything like that, right? But to have a hundred thousand people doing, uh, you know, digital marketing, affiliate marketing, whatever, on a forum was was unheard of. Right. Uh, and I was a moderator in that forum, and you know, I've always I've always prided myself and, and focused on you know delivering value to people you know, without trying to be spammy and, you know, try and educate and 
you know, good thing, if you do good things, you know, good things will, will come back to you. Couldn't but, agree more. Calm is real. 100% agree with that. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of brings us up to uh, what you're kind of doing now. And I'd love to touch on that in more detail, maybe at the, the end of the interview. But we've got some incredible questions coming through. Like I said, I've never been so excited to hear the answers of questions that people have asked you because I want to know them myself. Right. Um, so, yeah, if we can dig into a few of those questions, I'd love it. If that's OK. Mm hmm. Amazing, guys. And don't forget, if you are watching, um, say hello to me and J Jason. Also, feel free to leave some questions on here. I don't want to take, can't take up too much of Jason's time, but hopefully we can fire through some of these questions and get some real value for you uh, inside the landing page lab here. So question number one, uh, Tim A has asked, what's the best upsells to offer and where in the funnel can you, can you or do you increase your AOV? So across your e-com funnels, what are you guys doing to increase AOV? Where are you adding upsells, expedited shipping, all that kind of good stuff? What have you seen that's worked? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we do we do a lot of e-commerce. Um, I, I think it depends on if you're running a Shopify store, if, if you're running you know one, single product funnels with bundles. It, it just depends on what you're doing. But I mean, there's many different places to monetize that user, and you know I think where you where you have to be cognizant is um, you know, there's a lot of upsell stuff in Shopify that you can do pre-transaction, you know, and uh, that may bring up your average order value using those, but you really should be running some kind of split test to understand, uh, you know, is uh, is that decreasing your, your overall eCPC e or your eCPM um, on stuff? Because uh, you know, one of the one of the things we fo have found as we've built our stuff is we really focus on, um, you know, how much profit we're making uh, before media, you know, per click, um, you know, per click. So, what what I mean by that is that that factor kind of takes into account: are you selling larger bundles, smaller bundles? Are you selling higher prices, lower prices? Are you selling? Uh, upsells, uh, pre-checkout that's reducing conversions, but right. overall your, your right. earning yeah. your profit per click is going up. Um, <clears throat> is one click post, uh, you know, post credit card uh, upsells as well. You know, very heavily disclosed and letting the consumer know. You know, there's a lot of guys out there running stuff. It's like your order is not finished yet, and yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. like. Click it. <laughs> yeah. Showing them that they've already bought and letting them know if they click this button, they're gonna they're gonna buy more. Um, but you know, the other piece of this is you you've got your original transaction that happens, right? And you've got everything that happens through that. That's you know that you can work on conversion rate optimization, pre upsell, post upsell, bundle sizes, pricing. Uh, you know, most commonly bought together. There's tons and tons of stuff you can work on there. But the other piece that you have to consider is what happens post transaction that not in the funnel, but, you know, are you doing those upsells and upsetting right. customers by not disclosing stuff and ultimately uh, potentially uh, decreasing your lifetime value? Maybe those customers would, would come back and buy more from you. I was about to ask that question. Are you are you then doing email automation follow ups? If to increase that lifetime value of the client? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. We do email follow-ups. We also do, uh, we use uh, some SMS, um, you know, coupon opt-in SMS stuff like Attentive or Postscript. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately it just, it depends on, on what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go. I mean, you know, for us, we're, uh, we're a branded physical good company. So, you know, we just, we just got into 3,700 Walmart stores for our products. Amazing. Um, you know, one of the larger tests that the, the guy we're working with, uh, you know, that's their test with us. We've never, we've never ran with them before. Yeah. Um, you know, what is it doing on Amazon? You know, if you're in the e-commerce and product world, man, there's, there's so many different factors that, that need to be taken into account. Um, you know, and then also, uh, you know, I got into e-commerce, you know, buying Russell Brunson's book, Dot Com Secrets. Uh, and, and he talks about the um, the value ascension of a customer, right? Like maybe they buy, I don't know, some flip flops to start or they buy a pair of shorts to start, but then they like your brand. 
right. and then you, you start selling them or and maybe but they buy the non-luxury version and they start you know as they get more money they they spend more money with your company you know all these things need to be taken into account when you think about upsells and and how you present them um you know so yes we we monetize the the front end transaction as much as possible our our goal is always to um our goal is always to make a profit on the media we're spending on the front end our margins are, are fairly thin in that original transaction but yes as long as we as long as we're profitable we can spend more and more money and and not lose money you know acquiring a customer and i was about to say first and foremost you're acquiring that customer yeah and then you're optimizing further but in general you you basically split test every piece of the puzzle to see for that product for that price what's going to convert better post upsell pre-purchase upsell expedited shipping order bumps bundles price points you're yeah, you're basically you've got like a you've got like a, a tick list i guess which you work through and say okay well now let's test three bundles against five bundles let's test this price point against this price point let's test post purchase against pre-purchase and then yes. you're kind of almost like when you're spit testing a landing page you're working on one element at a time and then you're kind of sticking that as your control and then you're going to the next one correct we also um you know i gave you that kind of what i call gross profit per click or gross margin per click this is pre-media cost how much it's uh, equivalent in epc right um the other thing that you have to look at there is your refunds and chargebacks yes of course so, you know if you've got a 20 percent refund rate which i know some people do or you've got a really high chargeback rates you know even if this shows one dollar a click and this shows 85 cents a click you got a 20 percent refund rate you probably are, are, are worse off, even though this on the front end is looking right. better in the back but if you're end. doing something scammy on an upsell or yeah, right. people are getting pissed off and re recharging, then exactly you're losing, right. yeah. So we really monitor, you know, we test everything. Like you like you said, it's like, oh, okay, well let's try low, lower prices or let's try bigger discrepancies for larger bundles or let's try, and it all boils down to that one single metric, you know, which is, which is uh, you know, click minus, uh, you know, profit per click or margin per click minus refund. Fascinating. We'll, we'll move on to the next question, but just quickly on that. So when you're saying you're testing, let's say, for example, you're going to test a price point. How, yep. how much traffic are you driving at that sales page? Because, you know, I've worked with Jason for, for years for context. We've done some of your landing pages in the past. I know you have an internal team, but I know I'm not going to divulge exactly what you do or sell or whatever, but I know you are a believer as we are in driving traffic to these dedicated direct to consumer sales pages as opposed to product pages and stores because we all know it converts better. Let's say you're testing a product, uh, a pricing, uh, a price point on a uh, sales page. How much traffic are you driving to, to that page before you can, uh, you know, reliably say, okay, well, this, this price point converts better than this. I mean, you, you have to use statistical significance, right? I mean, it depends, uh, you know, the closer the differentiation is on percentage, if it's, you know, 1% voices, 1.05%, you need way more traffic than if it's 6% versus 3%, right? right? And you need to understand, do I, have I driven enough data or am to I get not, that margin? Yeah. Okay. Get, get that understanding. So, you know, for us, it's it's almost it's it's a we have a process around it, but it's not like we're running something and then we're checking it every day. We just set it up and we let it run for however long it runs. Like I I don't even know what tests we're running right now, and then weekly we'll do. Uh, you know, one one guy on my team will will look at all the split tests. They'll look at all the data points and make a decision whether this is better or that is better. Now, you know, we'll we'll check on it daily. You know, if something is heavily skewed, if we're getting zero sales on this and this has been converting at five percent, yeah, you know, really quickly we're gonna we're gonna cut that test. But anything that looks you know somewhat close, you let it play out. We let it play out. Yeah. Awesome. Amazing. Great insight. Thank you, guys. Remember, if you're watching this live stream, say hello to me and Jason. Put your questions in the chat. Uh, but we're going to stick to the e-com subject. Um, and just again, for some context, Jason is very experienced in the lead gen world as well. Um, so we'll get into some of those questions in a minute. But uh, Moreno has asked, what do you see 
for e-com in the next 10 years. So we were just discussing COVID, your offline kind of CEO friends in your mastermind saying, you know, Jason, we need to, we need your help. We need to go online. Are you just seeing more and more kind of big companies coming online, doing the online play? What do you see over the next kind of five to 10 years in this space? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, natural progression, right? So if we look at, you know, I like to tell the story of my uncle, who's, uh, I think he's 82 now, something like that, or 80, 82, somewhere in there, you know, uses a phone a little little bit, uses an iPad a little bit, definitely never bought anything online. His yeah. wife never really bought anything online. Well, all of a sudden, he's in a high-risk category, and, you know, he's somewhat scared to go into into retail stores because, you know, he's had cancer and, you know, he, he has you know, infections and stuff like this. And understandable, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, he, so he's like, Oh, okay. Well, you know, so then he called up, uh, he called up and was like, Oh, how do you do Amazon? And it's like, Oh, just do this, put your credit card in, pop, 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 pop. And he's like, wow, that was sure easy. He's like, I'm never going to go to a store again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? This, this is what COVID is just forcing, you know, that demographic into into buying online uh you know we obviously already bought online we had amazon packages every day or every other day at our house yeah uh, you know we're just buying more online now um it's just easier um you know i i think as you as you look online you know as of right now some some trends i'd like to understand how and i'm, I'm starting to see them so you know, if I if I look way back when, you could never sell any kind of regular product online. It always had to be some whiz bang, something amazing, or make promises that it that it would do something that it, you know is is unbelievable and and be at a price that is unbelievable as well. And you know, I really got into the e-commerce space, like building my own product brands, um, about three and a half years ago. Um, and what I saw happening was all these people selling drop shipping stuff yeah. uh, and, and people buying just regular everyday items on on something like Facebook, um, you know, which, you know, that that was believable on search. Right. If you have high intent traffic where somebody goes to search for a light bulb or a, a dog collar or a dog bed or, you know, shampoo or whatever it might be, um, you know, they'd go to search or they'd go to Amazon. Those things were believable. But when I saw people starting to run ads for regular everyday products right. um, you know, online that, or on Facebook, which was not a high intent channel, I was like, OK, now it's time to really start to develop to develop some brands on this channel. You know, in, a, in addition to that, you know, what I'm looking at right now and, and I have a bit of a belief is, you know, impulsy type stuff lower cost uh, uh, lower front end cost stuff uh, things you might see on uh, direct response TV as an example are are the kind of products that, that are doing well but you know what's interesting is I'm, I'm starting to see some $500 products some $1200 mm. products being am advertised on on Facebook you know with large likes with large engagements and you know, that just tells me consumers are getting more comfortable with spending more money online, making larger purchases and larger purchasing decisions online. Um, so I, I think that's interesting where, uh, you know, I think anything that is a, a somewhat commoditized product will be bought 90 to 95% online at some point. I think uh, retail stores will be an experience, right. uh, you know, I still like to go to the Gucci store. I still like to go to uh, Scotch and Soda. Now, that's not to say that I don't buy online. Once I know the shoe size that fits and I know the thing, you know, yes. I still like the experience of going to the store. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, brands, it's it's still yet to be seen to me if if large brands can be generated, you know, that's tied and, and it's starting to happen on, on the commodity space, but can it be done in the luxury space is interesting and uh, making some investments and in, I'm a big skier. So making some investments into um, a luxury ski brand uh, that I believe in, you know, can that stuff be built online through through influencers and stuff? I, you know, I, I'm sure it's already happening. I'm, I'm just not that much in the know. I'm, 
uh, on the higher higher ticket kind of items on the high ticket stuff yeah i mean i i look at vw bought you know all these other luxury car companies you know <laughs> and and vw is the cheap mass scale right so, yeah yeah very true. You know, uh i uh you know i've always been like okay i'm gonna be vw because i want i want scale right or you look at zara zara yeah. is uh you know i think i don't know right now but i think the owner of zara was the third richest person yes. in the world yeah, right? yeah, yeah. spanish guy i think yeah it's, it's not gucci or not you know uh any other super fancy brand louis vuitton owner it's well, volume yeah this guy is pretty pretty rich now too but uh you know, he's done a, a tremendous job on consolidation, but not over not over a single brand. But. Fascinating. Um, okay, so Mo has said from your data, this is uh, we've got some really kind of wide questions from business to landing pages, conversion rate optimization. So I'm just going to throw them at you in no order. If that's okay. <laughs> um, so Mo has said, yeah, from your data, what is the best call to action button? Text and colors that you've seen convert like is there a go-to when you're building an e-com product it's direct to consumer it's for example selling a dog bed what do you have on that call to action button is it add to cart is it grab mine now is it what color is that button what call to action do you go for you know i i wish i could give you an answer and you know this is not me being cryptic because i know the answer um you know we're testing different checkouts and different buttons and whatever by by product and depending on the consumer, depending on the demographic, depending on the user, depending on so many different things. I mean, we run different checkouts for different products, even though, yeah. even though you know, we have our standard templatized checkout that we run on everything, we're, we're constantly testing new checkouts and we're testing them across different products and different products. The checkouts, some checkouts perform better and some checkouts perform worse. Some language on the button, um, you know, performs better and, and some performs worse. And, uh, you know, typically something, you know, as a, as a macro, something relating to their happiness of getting it or receiving it, uh, you know, that verb of, you know, get, I mean, that, that's what we tend to use now. It's that is get mine now, rush my order. Yeah. It's, it's kind of that exactly. more descriptive. Uh, then add to cart buy now it converts better as far as colors have you seen anything that's always the case you know or is it again it's just a case of you we, we run on orange. Uh, i think we run blue sometimes you know but you know to, you, your standard green and orange are, are pretty pretty much that is yeah that's what i say on all our videos green and orange always work better. we're not getting the big gains on you know we conversion rate optimization is great you know but you know, headline, super, super yes. powerful, hero shot, powerful, bullet points and subheads, powerful, button copy, button color. Eh. I mean, we test it, but it's not it's not the, the biggest bang for the buck. You know, pricing, sure. pricing is almost always the, the biggest bang for the buck on any kind. So you would you would as a split test initially, you would always just go with pricing. Yes. Ah, interesting. OK. And you would just do like two different price points and split the traffic or would you do like 10 different price points or uh you know sometimes it's quantity sometimes you know for us we run we run uh you know we run like three different package selections and then vary the price you know there's what's in the package what of what the prices of the package are yeah and you're all constantly <laughs> testing those different combinations and price points and right and and what you know that's where we find the most bang for the buck i mean well awesome we'll double the price we'll double the conversion rate sometimes with price really rate. just from from that price point point. and is it always like let's say a, a relatively low ticket price and again i don't want to out what you guys sell or whatever and i know you might not even have a problem with me doing that but i'm not going to but let's say it's a 30 dollar product like are you testing like thirty dollars versus sixty dollars, or are you literally going like thirty versus thirty-three versus twenty-seven? Like, how how kind of how big are those tests? Sevens, nines, last number. Yeah. Uh, with or without cents. Yeah. Uh, you know, free shipping on certain Love one. It. Yeah. No free shipping on others. Uh, the bundles you don't want them to take ninety nine. The bundles you do want them to take sixty seven on the end. Wow. Okay, that's really cool. We're, okay, we test a lot, a lot of pricing stuff, and this is why I say it all comes back to, um, 
you know, and, and size. Maybe this has double the units, we'll triple the units for you. And, you know, but we'll, we look at it on a per unit price or a per piece price. So that's why it all comes back to that profit per click, right? Yes. Profit per click. Because if you're messing around with the cogs and the shipping cost and the processing costs and the refunds and all of this comes into play on any kind of test. It's a much bigger piece. Yeah, yeah. Totally get it. That's awesome. From, from our perspective on those bundles and the price points, we always find it's that middle bundle that gets selected the most. Like you can obviously have your cheap individual product versus your six product bundle that is best value, but it's always that most popular kind of three bundle package that, that kind of tends to sell sell, sell the most. And well, people are, I, I feel, are missing out from not bundling because instead of you will on average sell more of three than you will of just an individual one. Well, I mean, you have to drive up the AOV, right? Like if you're going to, you know, spend on spend on media you, you yeah. have to the AOV. Um, you know and, and in my opinion that's only going to work for a certain period of time we are going to get to a point with media costs where it's just you know i don't care how much optimization or what you do it's going to get more and more expensive over time and you know it's going to become more about lifetime value what does what else does the customer buy from you? How much do they like? Right. Are they buying in retail? Are they buying uh, through whatever other channel? And I guess that's that's that brand play, right? That's that building that bigger picture. You know, having multiple products. We always say like start with a landing page. Once you've proven concept, build a store. You can then do your email play on the back end, like you said, that right. kind of retail play. Um, awesome, amazing. Okay, so we have a few questions on the live stream. Um, Alex Brown says he loves you. Uh, love some Jason Active. Um, Mitch has asked, what is your favorite platform uh, for building lead gen landing pages? I'm, guess, I'm guessing he's talking if you were to build on like a, a software um, as opposed to custom, um, or would you tend to always lean towards static HTML raw? Um, I mean, it depends on skill set and depends on speed, right? Uh, you know, Unbounce is, is great. It's a more advanced platform you know, Insta Pages is great. It's a simpler platform, but you're not as skilled. You know, for us as a company, we're we're a strong user of Webflow at this point. Uh, you know, that's my favorite platform. Uh, you know, but if if you're not a designer, and you know you're not, uh, you know you're not adept at code or design, you know Webflow is probably not a great option for you. You know, it's a pretty complex platform, just mm -hmm. like Unbox is a is a pretty complex platform. You know, I'd go with Instapage or, or ClickFunnels even. I don't I don't know if ClickFunnels even has a lead module. It's been a while since I, I think they do. Um, but, you know, you gotta make sure that, that the posted data out, you know, whether it's in a web hook or whatever, you know, can get into some kind of a lead aggregation platform or does it hook to if it's if you're selling the data, you need to go into uh, like a lead media a or distribution, yeah, some kind of a distribution platform. Lead buy, so oh, yeah. You've got to look at what happens to your leads. If they're just your leads you're generating for for e-commerce, then you know any of them work because you could plug it into Mailchimp or Klaviyo or or whatever else you might play with on on that side to monetize that leads or whatever SMS platform you might be using for that. So. You know, you, you really have to have a, a holistic approach on, on what you're trying to accomplish. And, you know, most of most of my talks that I do are always very, where am I going? What am I trying to accomplish? What do those steps look like in, in yeah. the process? Um, you know, so always, always begin with the end in mind. I'm, I'm not married to, to any platform. Mm. Um, you know, if, for me, if I was going to go, if, if I had nobody to work with, just to do an e-commerce single product funnel, uh, I would use ClickFunnels just because it's quick, dirty, and easy, and I can right. vet prove something really quickly. If I want it's more, that, of I think it's that prove, prove something. I'm yeah, Shopify, of course. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. It's that prove something, which I I always stand by. Like ClickFunnels as a landing page builder is not great, and it, you don't get the best results for it. But it's that thing you just said. It's to get something to to market and to proof of the concept perfect, and then you need to come to someone like us, or right. you know, find find someone who can do something. A little bit more um, static and, and really optimized for, for low speed and stuff like that. Done um, is better than perfect, right, Oliver? Sorry, I said done is better than perfect. Definitely to begin with. Then you need to come start find getting, perfect. Start getting, start getting data. 
And the exactly. If you start getting data, iterating and making decisions, the quicker you're going to be successful. You know, I try and keep all planning to a to a small amount of time, and then just get the data, see if we're on track or off track, see what ne is the next direction to go. You know, assume that. You know what? Well, Okay, well, if you're running on ClickFunnels, you're going to go to a hard-coded page and start doing some some optimization. Maybe you, maybe you get a ten or twenty percent lift just on moving to some kind of static hard-coded hundred you know, percent type situation. You know, is it if, if you're a hundred percent certain certain it is what it is what you think it is? Now, you know, then if you want to use Optimizely, well, if you're doing a ton of traffic, I think at one point we were paying eight grand a month for Optimizely. I'm like, this is stupid. Like why? Why am I paying all this money to to this company? That's not to say it's not a good platform. Right. If you're a, if you're a brand, you know, a billion dollar company, and you're using an agency, and you know, it's a it's a great platform. But if you're a scrappy, you know, startup with not much capital, it's very expensive. You know, can you use Google Web Optimize? It's not as good as Optimizely, bottom line, but it's but it's free. Right. Yeah, all things that serves a purpose. Again, it's that proof of concept. You'll get some results, right? Yep. Yeah. No, couldn't agree more. I think I think those platforms are great to, to get that proof of concept to make sure that something actually you know it converts, and then you need to look into to going static or something a bit more advanced, which obviously we can help with. Um, moving on to another question about uh, tech. So M Brown has asked, "What does your technical stack look like?" Um, you mentioned Webflow. Are there any other uh, must-haves in your stack that you kind of use. I know you've kind of just said that it depends on the situation and stuff, but are there trackers that you're you're constantly using all the time? Are there you know other bits of software that you couldn't be without as a company? I mean, I <sighs> this is such a hard question to ask. Like, if you you know, I do, I have a mind map for our tech stack, and it probably has two hundred nodes on it um, for for all the different stuff that we use, but. Wow. You know, we really think of ourselves on the product company as as more of a tech platform, uh, tech marketing company more than we do an actual product company. Product product company. You know, we're building systems and, and automation and tech in order to roll out and consolidate new brands. So, you know, my my answer is going to be a little obscure, I think, for most people, um, but some some basic stuff. Um, we use an open source ERP platform called Odoo. That's O D O O dot com. Uh, we went with open source ERP because we wanted to write all of our own real time analytics code and, and uh, stuff like that. We use Shopify for our storefronts, obviously. Shopify feeds Odoo. Uh, we built all of our own CMS funnel building and, and so forth. Uh, we use Clavio on the email side. We're currently using Attentive on uh, on the SMS capture, coupon cap, running coupon capture. Um, we've looked at Postscript.io, but we just decided to go with Attentive because it, it was already in place there. Um, primarily Python, uh, you know, JavaScript. We run all flat uh, flat file uh, pages, so they're all HTML, JavaScript. We don't run any PHP right. like that. Yeah. Landing pages, uh, all of that's populated by the backend CMS. Uh, you know, using uh, using some heavy caching, uh, Cloudflare, GoDaddy, uh, Namecheap. Uh, I feel already there's enough uh, there's enough value in that answer definitely. Um, we yeah, have really really from the customer service, uh, you know, Facebook moderation side. Remaze is really a great platform. Gorgeous, Remaze, okay. but a better platform in my opinion. You know, from a from a UI and user perspective, but they charge per ticket. Remaze charges per user. Okay. Uh, so, you know, our bill would be two hundred thousand dollars a month. <laughs> It's you know probably two thousand dollars a month with Remaze, so it's, it's uh, and and Remaze has automation for all that. I haven't heard of it. I'll have to look into it. Yeah. Great yeah. Awesome. Some amazing value here, and um, we've got a few more questions to get through. If that's okay with yep. you, uh, we've got a few more comments on the live stream. Uh, Adam Pivko saying that we're definitely guys that people need to listen to. Thanks, Adam. Um, appreciate that. Uh, shame we haven't got any live events this year because I always see Adam shouting at my uh, last time I was on stage. Adam turned up and just shouted at me. 
um, from, from afar. So that was a big thank you. Um, okay, so Adam's actually asked a quick question. So he's saying, what are some opportunities you're seeing um, just getting started that are going to scale within 2020? So is there any like products or anything that you, you're seeing on the lead gen side or the e-com side that um, are, you believe are going to be you know, the next big thing in, in 2020? Um, and there's no right or wrong answer, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't pers I mean, some people look at trended stuff pretty heavily. I should probably look at it more than I do. Um, I'm more evergreen, and what's going to be there in five to ten years from now. Yeah, it's kind of how I I look at stuff more than trended. And, you know, it's going to be gone. It's going to be hot for 2020 and be gone in, in 2021. I'm, I'm always trying to build a sustainable business that's got a really solid foundation underneath. Um, and, you know, I think in the e-commerce product world, I, you know, any, any brand that you can create that's going to be competitive uh in the cpg space is you know it, it has been hot it, it's still hot there you know those guys are coming in whether it's them buying dollar shave club or or native deodorant or, or anything like that and you don't have to be super profitable but if you get to the size and scale where you're a threat to any of those companies they're going to take you out as soon as or try and take you out as as soon as they possibly can um you know i think looking at that cpg stuff and outside of the us um you know is is super interesting i mean i think you've got tons and tons of startups in the us that are that are focused here but but what about the the smaller countries in in south america or or asia or whatever you might whatever you might have it i think you know if i was if i was gonna start and i i, I didn't have a lot of budget and i didn't have you know a, a lot of um uh, resources yeah. you know, to really scale something huge, knowing what, I mean, we run at a 12% margin, you know, and we buy all of our own media. We, we, we do everything ourselves and we buy in bulk and we buy for cheap. And like, you know, most of the time I'm not concerned about telling people what my products are because <laughs> you, you just couldn't, you couldn't run it properly. Yeah. You know, yeah, we've yeah. done so much to be able, you know, we, on the e-commerce side, we do anywhere from probably about 150,000 to 200, 250,000 a day in revenue. Right. You know, our, our goal is our goal is to get that up to, you know, I don't know, 500,000 a day, hopefully by by next year. But, you know, it's very thin margins and it's very optimized from a shipping standpoint, from a warehouse standpoint, from a, you know, supply chain buying standpoint. You know, now we're looking at can we start to buy some of the batteries that make up part of the components or some of the LEDs? Just cost shaving make, wherever you can to, to make that yeah, margin better. Buy the yeah. resin at a discount, you know, that's getting marked up, you know, to continue to to work down that, um, yeah, yeah. that margin con consistently, you know, because- when you're at that scale, that's a huge difference, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's a massive difference, um, you know, and, and we can continue to run where uh, you know, somebody that comes in and tries to clone what we're doing, you know, they just, it's, it's not going to work from them. And then as you know, one of our big things that in, in 2020 and, and especially in 2021, it's, you know, hiring a merchandising manager to understand what our consumers want to buy and then moving to selling, you know, 30 to $50 products to 300 to a thousand dollar products, uh, that those, you know, once we have that customer in our, Kind of in our uh, sphere of influence yes, yes, yes. uh you know and we can increase that lifetime value so you know because what what is definitely going to happen is prices are going to go up on media period um and especially you know for us we we primarily are 45 plus you know we're not selling to 20 year olds and i think there's some really interesting opportunities there that's not our wheelhouse at this current point in time that that is Snapchat, that is TikTok, that is right. all channel. All these new platforms opening up, yeah. Super, super low dollar, you know, $9 AOV, $20 AOV transaction stuff. But it's a completely uh, different way of selling, right? Yep, than, than what we do currently. Yeah. 
Interesting. Okay, so we've got one more question about uh, more about the kind of conversion rates and landing pages, and then we've got a couple of questions about your kind of company and, and the way you run it and structure and stuff, if that's okay. Sure. Um, amazing insight so far. Thank you so much for giving us the time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so Elon has said, how important is copy on a landing page versus the design and the layout of the landing page? Where do you guys lean? Is it both? Do you focus a lot on copywriting? Um, do you test that copywriting? I know you mentioned split testing headlines. Everyone should be doing that, but do you test all the copy throughout the pages? How, how important a factor is that in conversion rate? I mean, headlines, subheads, bullet points are going to be your most important copy. Depends on you know what you're selling. Are you do you have a complex product? Do you have a simple product? Uh, do you are you trying to differentiate your self in some way you know most of our products on the product side are demonstrable so you know we started with lots of copy and we moved to tons of imagery uh with bullet points and and then even taking most of the copy that was written and turning it into images and videos or or something yeah, about to ask so you're doing like animated gifs you're doing video or you're doing like yeah. pictures yeah. walking along what kind of works best or just a mix of all all of it lifestyle yeah. shots use of shots i mean i think Depending on what you're selling, uh, if you're selling, you know, physical good, demonstrable product, I think, you know, Amazon is a great place to look. There's a lot of really amazing people, you know, that do stuff on there that, you know, sell that kind of stuff. So what's probably working on Amazon is, is probably going to work in a physical good world. But, you know, we also, um, you know, we also on the AFRD side, you know, have a media buying team over there. You know, and they run financial newsletters, which is long form VSLs seem to yes. be the best or long form sales letters, lots of copy, you know, building the story, super, super important, you know, for that kind of stuff. Uh, some of the Legion stuff is no copy at all. You know, it's just right to form people understand, oh, I'm getting insurance. Great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, it, it depends, you know, from a, from a copy, I would. I would tell you I would veer towards copy much more than I would veer towards page design and, and you know, color palette and, and imagery. Um, you know, but it again, it, it's going to depend on the product category. I, I hate to I always hate that cop out answer of it depends. But, you know, if, if you do one thing, it probably doesn't depend. If you do 100 things, you really see, oh, well, this it, it really depends. You know, we ran on our product pages, you know, we've run, you know, video as the first thing you've seen and you, we've run images as the first thing you right. see and some images perform better and sometimes a usage image or a, or a lifestyle type image performs the best and, and sometimes just a pure product shot performs the best. So, you know, you just gotta, you gotta really test all this stuff. I was about to say, I think yeah. if, if anyone can take anything from this video, it's to test. It's just, it's just to, to split it out and test it. Um, and yeah, I think that's very valuable. Um, we, we're doing a lot of, like you say, the kind of shorter copy pages, but more image heavy. Um, people like to be shown exactly how they can get that product and then how they can benefit from it. So if you can do that in images, like we now as a standard do this, this second section in, in our landing pages that's like, this is how it's going to get to you and this is how it's going to benefit you. And it's like that three, right. seven, one, you that's get it ordered, two, it's getting shipped to you, three, it's changing your life for the better in this way as a benefit. Um, and that's a visual Oliver, thing. Oliver, on the Legion side, you yes. know, there's, there's conversion rate and then there's quality of the lead that's generated. Right. Well. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, you may you may find something that converts thirty percent better, but it creates a terrible lead quality, and you get cut off from from that you know buyer. They don't want to work with you anymore. Right. So, you know, can you you know pull other levers and say, okay, well, you know, this one is pr producing super high quality leads for you, but it converts way less for me, and it's not nearly as profitable. Can you pay more for the lead? That lead? Absolutely. Can I generate yeah. them through this way, and most of the time the answer is yes. If you've got a good merchant, you know we yeah. own a bunch of our own Legion forms and products, and have buyers and call floors on the back end on the APD side. And sure, you know it's always about you know quality conversion rate, price per lead. You know, it's never. You know, if, if we've got affiliates on the call, you know, it's never about just how much money you're making yeah. on the front end. 
It's I'm about how to build a long-standing relationship with the partner to make sure that you're producing quality and, and you're also profitable at the same time because everybody wants you to make money and, and they want to make money. And, you know, it's all about that solid foundation versus, oh, if I run this, if I say something's free and it's not free and I, you know, I convert way better, but then all there, I cause a bunch of refunds. Right. Yeah, that's very or, short. Yeah. On the lead gen side, I generate hundreds of numbers, but no one can get hold of them. Like, right. you're not, you're not going to have a good uh, relationship with that buyer. Right. Um, yeah. I guess that's as well where validation comes into it. Um, multi steps work very well for that. And also, um, ping tree on the back end. So you can obviously have a, a buyer A, buyer B who, who have different qualifications of the lead. Um, and obviously you sell your top leads to your top buyer. Um, and then fire out back, back on the back end. And other monetization channels, whether the, on leads, whether that's CPC at the back end or, right. you know, survey questions to resell that data to other people. I mean, a lot of lead gen stuff breaks even on the on the actual lead, like auto insurance, right? Probably breaks even for a lot of people on the lead capture itself, but then they're re-monetizing that data is where they make all their profit. Absolutely. Another, uh, yeah, another great answer. So just got a couple of questions, if I may, about um, company and structure. Um, obviously, people who uh, know what you do and what your company is. Um, so even has said, uh, what does your inner company structure look like? And how much are you involved in the kind of day to day running of your company? Uh, I'll, I'll speak to a for first. Um, you know, we've got we've got three pillars in, in a for uh, As I see it, we've got media buying, We've got product and we have the network business. And then I, anytime I build a, a pillar inside of a business, uh, I typically have some sort of leadership over that pillar that that leadership hires, trains, manages, is responsible for the KPIs. You know, as it grows, they wind up with sub leaders under them. So uh, Matt runs runs the network. Well, he actually oversees all of a pretty at this point, then, yeah. but he, um, you know, he, he one of his main responsibilities is running the network. You know, Jen is kind of overseeing the business development side of the network. Brandon Moore is overseeing the affiliate management side of the network. So there's leaders underneath that coach and mentor and, and you know, that kind of stuff underneath. So, you know, what I used to do when I was younger is I thought about uh, employees and staff as costs. And and really, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of that that way, they, they should be adding value to the business. And even if they don't directly make make money for the business they take load off of people that actually do and allow them to make a lot more money for the business mm, that's an um, interesting way of thinking about it so i, I wrote a blog post on my blog uh jason a, a while back uh and it says if i was to start a company the first person i would hire is a director of operations and the, the reason is is i need that leader to take all the stuff out of my brain and put it into standard operating procedures, systems, hiring, so on and so forth. So if you look at uh, Jamiac, my um, my product company, uh, you know, I have leaders that at the very highest level and in, in C level roles, they yes. have, you know, somebody that handle oversees logistics and supply chain, somebody that oversees customer service. Uh, we're just hiring somebody to oversee marketing. We have somebody that oversees tech. You know, and obviously uh, our director of platform reports up to our CTO, uh, but really this is the person that hires and trains and manages the team. Ultimately, these people up here are just helping these people down here, you know, take stuff off of their plate because there's always 10 times as much stuff as, as they can work and do. So, you know, I'm a very much leader first company that is, you know, if you're like, hey, we need to hire uh, some designers, I'm like, okay. Who's, who's going to hire them? Who's going to manage them? What systems are in place in order to get it done? We're not just going to go hire a bunch of designers. Like that's that doesn't work because then they're inefficient. And all of a sudden it becomes my responsibility, right. uh, you know, to take care of them. So I've talked, to, I've talked about this a little bit in the past. I, not this year, but, you know, most years I vacation somewhere between 100 and 120 days a year. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that process for me is to let my leaders mature because if I'm sitting there with them each and every day, micro-correcting everything, you know, they don't have a, a, a chance to shine and, and, you know, 
own yeah. their own shit. Yeah. Yeah, I let them be autonomous on their own, but yeah. you know, I'm always there as a crutch. And at some point in time, you need to leave and let people let people actually. Fall. So you're you're almost mentoring your kind of leaders, and then letting them do do the same to their their yeah. staff and their their people exactly. below them. Right. And, and then are you the person who's setting your leaders' targets, or are they coming up with them themselves? Or because obviously you have, I'm sure you have like a a projection for what you want to achieve this year, five years. Are you then getting those targets down to your people, your leaders, and then they're projecting that on their staff or, or how does that work? The core model is me. I, you know, and I think in spreadsheets yes. and the core model and the core unit economics of, of what we're doing is me. So I'll go, you know, for our business, we typically, you know, I'm trying to look at on the product side, every product we bring in, we wanted to do somewhere between four and 6 million a year in revenue per SKU. And, you know, so how are we testing? How are the, we bringing those on? How are we testing them? You know, that's one process that, that we have built. And then how do we identify them is another process. And then, you know, once they're up and running and they're one of our kind of cornerstone products that, that run consistently, you know, how do we keep them alive? How do we keep them invigorated over time? That's another process, right? And, so what I'm typically doing is saying, okay, here's our core model. Here's our core unit economics around the model. We want to be at a hundred products by the end of next year, let's say, and that would be 600 to say 600 million, 400 to $600 million company. Maybe, you know, how do we get there? And yes. you know, if we come in at a $200 million company next year. I wouldn't be sad about that. Right. You know, we'll probably do 60 to 80 this year. Um, but constantly saying here's, what we're trying to achieve. Here's the unit economics. How do we build the systems, the infrastructure and the tech in order to, to do this at scale? And, you know, then, you know, once we have all that machinery and mechanics built out of the factory, as I call it, for that core unit economics, then we layer on, we build a micro influencer outreach system. We build a PR system for the brand. We build a retail system. We build right and then we look at each of those things set you know our ultimate goal is was to get into walmart you know we're like let's go after the biggest retailer okay we're into walmart now we're building all the systems to how do we bring all the other brands and products into walmart how do we make sure that every product test is a win and how do we do that consistently each mm -hmm. and every time so that as we scale these brands but it's just a process <laughs> yeah tv we're going to be rolling out on tv in the next two weeks as well yeah short form 30 second to 120 second spots um you know what's the process behind that how do we roll out internationally uh you know all these and then things how do we make it easier when we do it again with the next product how, how do we make it super super simple you know uh matt matt stanzel who runs the network in the apd side of the business you know he always says what would this look like if it were easy you know? <laughs> and, I, and i'm always trying to think of okay well in the short term, you know, what are we duct taped together with whatever and people and whatnot, but ultimately, you know, how do we elevate our people and take all the really mundane, re repeatable tasks out and turn them into technology? Yes. It, it's constantly where we're pushing. And then, you know, you've got your pipes you build and then you'd start doing your data analysis. Then you move into machine learning to make decisions on inventory forecasting and bidding and buying and where, you know, if you, if you set up a campaign and you run it worldwide, how does the machine understand what countries to buy in and, and which ones are profitable and which ones to scale and, you know, answering those questions. So they're not human driven, but, you know, uh, they, they're machine assisted, human, yes. human driven, but, but machine assisted. I'm Back I still the, data. to the point where, where a machine can, can do it. Awesome. Fascinating. Um, so just a last question about a uh, company and then we've got one more question if that's okay. Um, Stephen D has said, uh, how are you scaling big teams and do you have any advice about scaling a team? Leadership, 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 leadership is, is what it's all about. Uh, and those are, those are operational leaders. I think as marketers, sometimes, you know, we look at leadership as somebody that's a really good marketer. You know, to me, leadership is uh, leadership and management is, you know, 
people that can hire, manage, and train. We're, we're just in the process right now of hiring a full-time recruiter inside of A4D and Jamrec to share, you know, just to bring on, to bring on people, um, you know, and then how do we manage those people? What do we measure? Uh, you know, I read a book a long time ago, probably three, four years ago now that, that kind of changed my life. It's called The Goal. Uh, by by Elijah Goldrat, I believe. The goal. And, okay, I've got to get Andy yeah. to read that. It's um, it's about building a fact. It's about this guy who turns around a factory, he goes into a failing factory. I forget what they were making, some kind of widget, and it's failing. And um, you know, he he goes through this process. Uh, Goldrat's kind of like a a Yoda type mentor to him through the process. A really fun, good story, just enjoyable to to listen to or or read. Um, and, and you go, what does this have to have to do with, uh, you know, what does this have to do with digital marketing, right? That's a factory. These are, these are different. And for me, what it said was, you know, what I'm building in my product company is I'm building a factory, but it's a factory of people and technology, right? What, what are these as repeatable processes when you take this part out of this machine and you then put it in this machine to be worked on because that this is a punch press and this is the the coin press that's going to finish the part if it doesn't come from here to here at, you know well it's not going to work right or you take it from the wrong machine or this machine's much slower than this machine that's fast then you're going to have to get two of these machines so thinking about that production line like how do we test new products and how do we roll out new products and how do we consistently run new products uh and then how do we scale the current products um it really changed my mindset of how i think about a business and even though we don't have machines per se we have people so what does this say? This says making sure that we hand something from, if it's coming from creative and needs to go to dev, that's like it coming from a punch press to a coin press. Yes. It yeah. needs to come a certain way. How do we you know, do efficiently enough? enough? Yeah. That, it, that is solving these problems. Like Figma is really a, an amazing platform. You know, we go Figma to Webflow now, and that's starting to solve some of that process and some of that problem because always the creative would give something to dev that potentially wasn't even codable and right. then they go back and that these people would hate these people and you know leadership and management really As, leadership about to ask, does that come from that coo person or that comes from that leader or in the department it comes from the leader right so where i spend most of my time is you know i sit on the floor i don't sit in a corner office i have a corner office i never sit in there because I like to listen to the dialogue that would happen between people and understand, or now it's on Zoom calls. It's like, oh, but this is this. I'm like, is that true? And then try starting to understand how do you make those systems flow, you know, more fluidly. And then as you more add more people, how do you make the jobs a little simpler, more measurable? Because when you start a startup, people have they potentially wear 10 different hats yes. and really yeah, yeah, absolutely. 10 different jobs. You know, I always talk about an affiliate. An affiliate is often a developer. Yep. They know development skills. They know media DevOps buying. skills. They know media buying. They might know some design. They know copywriting. They know business development. They know finance. Agreed. They know, right? Like analytics. Uh, you know, you need like 10 different jobs at a bare minimum to be a great affiliate. And you know, oftentimes people will come out of the affiliate world and then go to build a company and they think that, you know, people that come in should know how to do all those things. And, and really the way you have to think about it is one person can only do one of those roles, maybe two at most. Yes. And ultimately you need to understand, and, and a lot of people get frustrated, especially entrepreneurs, because, oh, they don't see everything that I see. And it's like, well, no, they're a designer. They just design. Right. Right. They don't understand conversion rate optimization. They don't understand coding. They don't understand this stuff. So it's that person above them that over, oversees that whole factory line. It's that person looking to optimize the machines. You know, if we got to make a part and it needs to go through 10 different machines, making sure are we asking the coin press to do the punch press's job here? Yes. And yeah. If we are asking the coin press to do the punch press's job, are we teaching them how to become a punch press and are we giving them enough time to become good at it? Because they're a coin press, 
Yes, yes, yes. I would say that they don't want to be a punch press or learn how to do that because people do love to grow. They love to become better. And But you can't tell them how to do this one time and then expect they're an expert. You, you probably need to give them 30 days to six months, depending on what it is. To at least yeah, have a, a no, that's, that's, that's amazing. It's, it's resonating with me a lot. So, um, yeah, I, I can, uh, I'm glad someone asked that question because that's helped us as well. Um, what was the book called again? Uh, the Goal. The Goal. Yep. Okay, perfect. We'll have, we'll have to look that one up. Okay, last uh, question, if that's okay. So Susie has said, uh, what's the most profitable offer or product you've ever ran uh, and are you still running it? And I, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, um, if you don't want to give it away. But um, yeah, some, some details on maybe volume would be great. I mean, uh, for, those of, for those of you that know me, uh, know I was involved in the free trial diet space, um, you know, back way back when. Uh, there was an offer called Wu Yi Tea. And it was a super aggressive offer and you know, like nothing I would be proud to say that I ever ran. <laughs> and at that point in time, Facebook ads was just released and, and you could buy all clicks for one set. Uh, any, any click you wanted and, you know, ROIs were massive and you could spend as, as much money as you want. So, so let's just say you did some serious volume with that offer. <laughs> yesteryear. You know, this is all, this is all yesteryear stuff. You've got to look at, you know, kind of where we're at today. And, Absolutely. And, what, what the opportunities are amazing um jason thank you so much there's been so much value uh, for me personally but also for for everyone inside the landing page lab and anyone watching this on youtube um can you just uh let us know how people can get in touch with your company um what you guys can, can offer um and yeah just again thank you so much for uh, joining us really appreciate sure. it um yeah, I mean, my my personal blog is jasonnakative.com. Amazing blog. Um, you need to you need to head to that. That's in the process of doing a redesign right now. I I haven't posted in a while. I, once I get the redesign up, I'll do some some posts again, and you know maybe do I'll put this on there, and you know I try and Amazing. put all the content and all my talks and stuff like that on there. I you know I'm so busy with building businesses, I don't I don't have a lot of time to sit down and and write out you know actual blog posts, but try and get as much video content I can as people ask me to do stuff. Um, so you. that's one, one thing we've got, I've got A4D, that's uh, A as in alpha, the number four, D as in delta.com. Uh, we're a CPA network. We do a lot of direct consumer uh, e-commerce stuff. We do a lot of lead gen uh, and we do a lot of financial newsletters. So if you have uh, products in that space and or uh, are, you know, really, I, I still think, uh, being an affiliate is still the best way to learn, uh, you know, direct response, uh, media buying online, right? You don't have to do the customer service or the product. Yes. Or yeah, absolutely. Or, or all the other stuff. It's, it's still, you know, if you just want to learn pure, uh, really pure, uh, creative building, uh, landing page optimization and media buying skills, I mean, Affiliate marketing is still the most pure, efficient way to learn that and not get distracted by by a lot of other stuff. So you know, if you have a desire to become good at those things uh, and, and don't want to do all the other stuff right now, you maybe have a great idea for a brand, but you don't know how to buy media. You may spend three months of your life or six months of your life in an affiliate, you know, really understanding how to buy media because that's going to give you such a leg of advantage when you want to start building. doing your education, right? Exactly right. Um, and then on the Jamiac side, you know, we're we're looking for anybody that's got a, a great product. There's two things there. We're looking for anybody that's got a great product that, you know, they potentially want to license out and have patents on and stuff like that, that we could roll into some of our brands. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, we're, we're actively buying, um, you know, distressed uh, companies that are, are good product companies. We just bought a brand called Bowbox. Uh, which is a travel uh, shoes. They'd raised nine million on Kickstarter. We just we just bought them and consolidating them under under the Jamiac umbrella. Nice. You know, we're looking for other brands to buy. Uh, you know, ideally have a great product line, have a strong you know following. Um, you know, maybe even we're EBITDA positive, but you know, got in too much debt and you know are potentially imminently going bankrupt. Um, you know, we're, we're really looking for any kind of opportunities in that space right now, because I think there's a lot of great brands out there 
that are, um, you know, built by really, really great product people and visionaries and, uh, you know, but they maybe, maybe they're not the strongest on supply chain and operations and media right. buying and all those other facets. And, and I hate to see those brands die and I'd, I'd love to consolidate them under, under what we're doing and, you know, hopefully retain the, retain the founders with the company and have them continue to, to drive their vision for the product and the brand and, you know, nice. let, let us drive the horsepower behind, uh, behind the scaling and the cash flow and, and all these kind of things. Love it. Guys, make sure you go check Jason's blog out. Um, it's an amazing blog. I've followed him for years. Go and check out the businesses. Um, once again, Jason, a huge, huge thank you from everyone. If you're watching this on YouTube, guys, make sure you hand over to head on over to landingpagelab.com. Join the free group. Um, Jason, thanks again. Go and enjoy that beautiful view behind you um, and hope you have an amazing day. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank Bye. you again. Cheers. Bye. Bye.